when a majority doesn't work. Now, through the years, you've heard me say many times, more than once, I assure you, about my belief concerning democracy. Listen to this. <clears throat> Written by Steve Farrell. I have some great persons in the United States, men like George Will. He had a good article last week in the paper. And others just as good and some even better. <clears throat> You're going to have to bear with me now this morning. George Chapman observed in 1605, quote, young men think old men are fools, end of quote. And so do progressives. <laughs> he makes it applicable, doesn't he? And so do progressives. As the constitutional debate over the future of the electoral college mounts. Now, the reason this article is so great, it explains the electoral college as well as I've ever heard anything on it. As the constitutional debate over the future of the electoral college mounts, there certainly is no shortage of youthful, progressive, cocksure experts exuding but one message. The founders were narrow, provincial men who took no thought for tomorrow. While we, the elite, the elite, Fifty lawyers were sent down by Al Gore to, to Florida. They've got a lot of lawyers down there. The elite class of the latter days are a better educated, more forward-looking group of universalists who are so much the wiser. But wisdom doesn't work that way. Wisdom slows down, takes a deep breath, looks back into history, and humbly searches the moral and political memory banks of those old men for a few valuable lessons we for a few valuable lessons to apply where appropriate. Wisdom knows if one fails to learn from history, one will ultimately fail. It was out of respect for the wisdom of the senior class that inspired the founders to wear white wigs because back then, generally, the older meant the wiser. Now you wonder why in England they wear those... <clears throat> Where is that humility, patience, and respect for tradition today? In a crisis, moderns prefer to do arrogantly and impulsively whatever it takes and get it over with, regardless of the principles compromised regardless of the long-term risks, regardless of how they trample upon the graves of their forefathers. Pretty potent, isn't it, folks? Consider election 2000. One side believes if we lose the count fair and square, let's reinvent the counting process. If the, Republican, if the Republican electoral college system gets in our way, let's get rid of it and shout democracy. 
Folks, I've never read anything better. Regardless of how you feel, I'll, you'll know where this old fellow stands. If we lack instant answers to tough questions, like, why not one person, one boat? Let's not rummage through dusty old books to search of, in search of ageless answers, but let's cave in in order to fit in. I'm trying to get my bifocus here so I can stay on the same line. One person, one boat. One national tally sounds like a good rule. But if we listen to the voices of the past, we might just learn that flat out majority rule is not the best rule. Did you get that? After all, absolute reliance upon the wisdom of majorities without the balance and checks. Balance and checks, that's what the electoral college is all about, folks. Without the balance and checks of other considerations, can get us into big trouble. De Tocqueville wrote in 1832, quote, If ever the free institution of America, institutions of America are destroyed, that event will arise from the unlimited tyranny of the majority. How many of you believe that? Hold your hand up. Some of you don't know, I guess. Okay, I'm going to feel you out. I don't care what you think of me. I'm going to feel you out. I'm going to, I, I won't know what you're thinking. Because we're in a crisis, folks. We haven't seen anything yet. Now, these seven questions I'm going to ask you this morning, I got all this up before I got this article yesterday. And I already had this prepared, so keep that in mind. My questions are not based on what I'm reading. It's confirmation of what I'm reading and, and what I'm giving. Lincoln echoed the same. If destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. As a nation of free men, we must live through all time or die by suicide. Moderns don't seem to understand that liberty brings with it those kinds of risks, those kind of risks, and that to decrease the risks, the founders put together something more complex than majority rule, a republic. A republic. Hope you're listening. John Marshall, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court between 1801 and 1805, explained, quote, Between a balanced republic and a democracy, the difference is like that between order and chaos. In the quote. And over-reliance on majority opinion brings injustice, stupidity, and eventually suicide. There is evidence. By majority vote, ancient Israel rejected a free system of judges for kings. Hope you know your Bible well enough to get that point. By majority, unanimous, vote Christ was convicted and sentenced to death. By majority vote, Greek city-states came and passed away in violent, short-lived fits of passion. By majority vote, Rome changed from a free republic to a brutal empire. And we're on the verge of it in America. I said we're on the verge of it in America. 
by a majority vote, the British House of Commons soundly rejected Thomas Jefferson's proposal to abolish slavery, slavery in colonial Virginia. By a majority vote, the British House of Commons passed the Stamp Act tax and other oppressive measures which led to the War of Independence. By a majority vote, the Continental Congress forced Jefferson to remove from the Declaration of Independence a passage calling for the abolition of the British tradition of slavery in the United States. By majority vote, the Sedition Act of 1798 passed, strict, restricting liberty of speech and the press. By majority vote, in the early and mid-1800s, the institution of slavery continued and spread to new states as they joined the Union. By majority vote, the South seceded, state by state, initiating a civil war, the bloodiest war in U.S. history, and, and the beginning of the end for states' rights. By superior majorities, Congress and the states passed the 17th Amendment in 1913, rejecting America's most important check against socialism and federalism and, and federal domination of the states. The election of U.S. Senators by state legislatures in favor of the direct election of the Senate by the people. A decade later, socialism began. Ever since then, by majority vote, Americans have adopted one socialist measure after another until the majority have come to believe that the federal government has the right to dis redistribute wealth and control nearly every economic and educational activity in this nation. Are you listening? I hope so. Recently, by majority vote, jurists were manipulated and intimidated by liberal majority media to set a new and dangerous pattern where compelling evidence against a murderer was ignored because the murderer was a member of a minority race. Ever since then, racial profiling has come to mean more in the minds of many than innocent of guilt. Innocence of guilt. By a majority vote, last year a president, guilty of perjury and obstruction of justice, was acquitted and by the feigned majority vote of opinion polls, a Senate refused to examine the evidence of those crimes and others because the polls told them that a conviction might hurt their re-election hopes. Are you listening? Finally, the broad majority vote of the nation's electors in the year 2000 is being challenged by the narrowly focused majority vote of a few big city states who want the right to break the rules, bully their way into supremacy, and for future conven convenience, abolish, abolish the electoral college system. The big city state majority feels that it matters not that the opposing candidate has won the support of 2,434 counties compared to their candidates, 677 counties, that the opposing candidate won the approval of the people who lived in over 2.4 million square miles of U.S. territory as compared with their candidates half a million miles and the opposing candidate won 60% of the states and captured the virtual representation of 143 million Americans versus their candidates, 127 million. Do you know what I'm talking about?
That is why in many of the above examples certain other factors came into play or should have come into play that did or could have halted the mistakes of the majority. Things like unalienable rights or alternative or appellate court hearings or war or Republican checks. Everywhere we look, in fact, we find our government offers all kinds of alternatives or checks to majority rule which are helpful. Consider, now listen closely, this is where you'll have to do some study, appellate courts of state and federal judges with no jury involved. Reverse the decision of people's courts of original jurisdiction. Civil convictions hold accountable those who fooled a jury on capital charges. A president's veto checks the majority will expressed in congressional bills. Supreme courts declare unconstitutional laws approved by majority, by majority of both houses of Congress. Congress and the president passed new legislation to reverse the majority. Decisions of the Supreme Court are limit its jurisdictions. Constitutional amendments override constitutional laws previously approved by super majorities of the people. Amendments are won not by simple majorities, but by tough and time-consuming house by house, state by state process in search of new super majorities. The Bill of Rights overrules laws which violates those rights. Governors and presidents issue pardons which overthrow the majority votes of juries. The affirmation of appeals courts or which prevents city courts, civil courts, action from taking place in the interest of preserving the peace or reversing a state injustice, possible injustice. State legislatures, like in Vermont, create laws which reject the law approved by the national will in Washington, all of which points to one thing, obtaining a sense of the majority will is important. But the majority will is not the word of God. And in far too many cases, it is about as far from the word of God as one can go. We all know this is true. So who are we to kid by insisting upon it? Our government is a republic, and republics, though imperfect, are careful about making laws and initiating change. They explore the law from a variety of angles rather than just the one angle of the majority. Folks, I like to read the rest of it, but it take too long. I want to read enough for you to kind of get a taste. I have one more here. Here is one I'll not read, but I'll tell you about it. And you can pull it down. How many of you know the name Larry Clayman? Only about six of you. Shame on you. Larry Clayman is head of what is known as judicial justice. He's a lawyer in Dallas. You, I, I've seen him many times and I've heard him. He's one man that gives all the appearance of having something here as well as here. And he loves this country. And you'll be hearing more from him. Winning the Right Way is the title of his article. I don't have time to give it to you. Here's another that I want to get for you. 
a short summary of Islamic beliefs and eschatology. I want to get that one for you too. Folks, if you're not prepared, you'll fall for anything when the going gets rough. So if you don't believe that I'm trying to strengthen, I'm doing it for myself and I'm doing it for you. I want to relax a little bit because I'm having a hard time talking so I'm going to have to slow down. Let me give you a little bit of this. Running on faith. Let me give you the religious views of both Bush and Al Gore. Now this is true. This is not something made up. These are statements which they personally have publicly made. The candidates for president have opened a window to their souls during the campaign. Both claim a deep faith in Jesus Christ, although that expresses itself in different ways. Here's a summary of what they have said about their religious faith. George W. Bush refers to himself as a lowly sinner. Well, I think he means that. I'll be honest with you, I think he means that. Now, I don't know if you... That doesn't mean that he has the truth on salvation and some important things. Uh, I'll go so far as to say, you know, he is a convert of Billy Graham. Did you know that? I'll tell you that. In just the last few years who is saved by God's grace. Now, here is his statement. First himself as a lowly sinner who is saved by God's grace. Well, that's a true biblical statement. Now, how much he knows about it, that's up to you to find out. That self-concept has humbled him, he says, and made him a better governor, prompting him to treat others with respect and tolerance. I don't know how far he'll go with tolerance. I've already seen him go too far for me. And I don't know how far you will go with tolerance. I want to find out, and I'm going to pretty well find out today with my questions that I'm going to ask you. He has admitted mistakes of the past, including a drinking problem and often cites the Bible in saying that a person should remove the log from his own eye before taking the speck out of another person's eye. Well, that's okay. He, he's learned a little bit about the scriptures more than Al Gore manifests. Bush was raised in a religious home. His father Episcopalian, his mother a Presbyterian. He was not particularly serious about his faith until 1986 at age 40 when he was drinking too much and allowing his marriage to go stale. He became more interested in God, had a one-on-one -on -one talk with Billy Graham, and began studying the Bible with a group of men. He says he experienced an encounter with Jesus Christ, an event he does not refer to as being born again. Well, now that's, that, that, that doesn't make sense to the person who is an informed person. But that, that could be out of ignorance. I said it could be. I just made a statement. I believe in being fair and objectively right. Bush says he prays every day in all kinds of situations. He has been seen to quietly bow his head in prayer before walking to the microphone, before big press conferences. He says he reads the Bible every day which he regards as the literal and inerrant word of God. Well, that's, I'll give him A on that statement. He goes through the one-year Bible, the one-year Bible every other year, picking and choosing different parts of the scripture during the alternate years. When asked what political philosopher uh, he admires most, he responded, Christ. Well, I'd have to 
I, I, I couldn't give him a very good grade on that statement because he changed my heart. He attends moderate, traditional, Hyde, Highland Park, United Methodist Church in Dallas, adjacent to the campus of Southern Methodist University. Bush insists that his faith is more than a sound bite, saying he tries to walk the walk and live what he believes. He wants to win the presidency, but says that if he loses, he will feel a calm and comfort based on his faith. His priorities in life are his faith and his family, his wife and twin 18-year-old daughters. Al Gore says that his faith is the most important thing in his life. I turn to my faith. I'm reading it as it is, folks. I'm not making up something. My faith. As the bedrock of my approach to any important questions in my life. That's enough for me right there. I don't even have to go any further. You say, I don't like what you're saying. You can lump it as far as I'm concerned. Or anyone, I don't care who it is. And I'd tell him so, right to his teeth. He is a Southern Baptist. That doesn't say much, does it? I have some I have some things about the Southern Baptists and how they are being tolerant today on issues that'll surprise you. But I'll ask you a question in later that'll include all of them. I'll read it again because I want to get it correctly for you. He is a Southern Baptist who was born again in his early 20s and no longer uses that phrase because it is often misconstrued, he said. He doesn't know what born again means. And most Baptists don't know. Even most Baptist preachers don't know. You say you're arrogant. That's your problem, not mine. I know what God has done for me by grace, folks, and that's the most humbling thing in the world. But I'm bold enough to say what ought to be said. He says, quote, this is Gore, everything in the Bible makes sense to me. I interpret it in my own way. Folks, I don't I don't interpret the Bible in my own way. Do you? If you do, let's disband because this is not a church. This is not an assembly of Christ. And that's what my tradition teaches me to do. I'm really going to have to slow down. hold out this morning. <clears throat> when faced with important problems, he says, he asks himself, what would Jesus do? Gore has an eclectic spiritual life. His father was a Baptist and his mother, Church of Christ. And he has straddled two worlds of Tennessee and Washington, D.C. <clears throat> As a boy, he attended revivals for two weeks. He attended revivals for two weeks every summer in the tobacco fields, then in the fall returning to St. Albans Prep School in Washington, D.C., going to daily Episcopalian chapel services at the National Cathedral. After service in Vietnam, attended Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt Divinity School to explore life's most important questions. But after three semesters, didn't find all the answers that I thought I might, he said. But I found better questions. And I found a process for living out better answers. Since then, he has explored a range of religious beliefs, 
toying with the New Age ideas. Most corrupt, blasphemous mess ever palmed off on the human public. Did you hear me? He came to see environmentalism as a religious obligation to protect the earth. His daughter has said that since moving into the vice presidential house, the Gores haven't found a church. When in Tennessee, he attends New Missionary Baptist Church, an evangelical congregation. Among even close friends, there are some differences of opinion about whether he is a believer or someone who believes in believing. I hope you get that. Churches today are filled with people who believe in believing. Do you know the difference? Who respects and admires faith in God, but finds the required leap outside his head a long, long way to go. End of quote. How many of you have heard all these things? I see your hand. None of you. Folks, I have some others that we may look at if I have time after I give these things. But I want to get into something else for a few minutes. <clears throat> I have seven questions that I want to ask. And they're all very important questions. I believe that we are in the last of the last days. Things are shaping up. I'm no date setter. I'm not that foolish. God has taught me too much to be that foolish. My first question is, can a person who believes in or promotes abortion a Christian? Can a person who believes in or promotes abortion, can he really be a Christian? Now I could give you some things about Gore and others, even though they believe in it, and some preachers are even trying to hold them up as, as believers, but they're not informed enough and all that. I'm asking you a plain, pointed question, folks. And I expect such an answer. And I want it to be a yea or a nay. Yes or a no. Is that asking too much of you? Well, I'll see. Can a person who believes in or promotes abortion be a Christian? What is your answer? My answer is no, he's not a Christian. Can't be a Christian. How many of you hold up your hand? How many of you are in doubt? Will you be brave enough to hold up your hand? You see, any person who believes in abortion is a murderer at heart. I'll put it, I'll make it real plain for you. Make it easy. Anyone who believes in abortion believes in murder. And no murderer 
is going to heaven according to Revelation 22.15. As a person who believes in murder, he won't go to heaven. My second question. Can a practicing, notice what I said, I'm true to scripture, can a practicing homosexual be a Christian? Yes or no? And I'm going to study with you this morning, yay or nay. We'll look at those passages. My answer is, no practicing homosexual is a Christian. And I'll go a step further to say, and in most cases, he's already been turned over to a reprobate mind, which means a worthless mind. And that's Romans 1, 24, 26, and 28. Take it or leave it. You say you're not, uh, you're not tolerant enough. Well, wait, I have another question for you. Now, how many of you believe that a practicing homosexual can be a Christian? Hold up your hand. You believe he can be a Christian? No one is holding up his hand. Well, Romans 1, 18 through 32 tells you about it. And the verse that clinches it is 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 11. Such were some of you were some of you. You're not now. By grace, you're no longer a practicing homosexual. Well, what about all these homosexuals who want to continue to practice their homosexuality and be members of the churches? They can't be here except over my dead body. Did you hear me? Now, you know, that could get a class action lawsuit against me by some of Gore's lawyers. I couldn't do a thing about it. So if that happens, I wonder if somebody here might inform me. <laughs> so I'd have to, well, now who, who heard me make that statement in church, turn me in? I've been turned into the FBI before, folks. That's not anything new with me. And I know the person who did it. And if God hadn't saved him, he's a Baptist. And if God hasn't saved him, I tell you now, he and I would not be members of the same assembly. Are you listening? So I know where you stand on that one. Well, I think, I thought I knew to begin with, but I want to find out. I'm either going to make a liar out of you or something. Now we have one. This is a simple, simple statement. But even most Baptists don't even believe it today. Is Jesus Christ the only Savior? Is there some other way that a person can be saved? All who believe that Jesus Christ is the only Savior. Hold up your hand. You know what that means? That means the Muslims are not going to make it, are they? Jehovah's Witnesses are not going to make it, are they? The Mormons are not going to make it, are they? Does that mean that you're bigoted? No, not according to the scriptures. Fourth question. Is the Christian to be tolerant? Tolerant. With false.
false views of Christianity. Now, I'm not going to go out here and wage war against the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses or anybody else. I'm not going to get my shotgun out and start shooting them. I'll treat them as human beings, but I'll tell them right where they're going if God doesn't by grace save them. And I hope you will too. Now, just to refresh our minds a little bit, I want you to look, I want you to see how tolerant Paul was. Turn to Galatians 1. Galatians 1. I want us to look at verses 6 through 9. I'd like to give you a lesson from the Greek text on this, but I've done that in the past, and we don't have time to do it this morning. Not necessary. I open your Bible. Let's begin with verse 6 and read through verse 10. Paul was a recipient of God's grace. He said... I'm amazed that you, many of the Galatians to whom he was speaking, are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different, different gospel. Which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even though we are an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to you or to that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Pretty strong language. I tell you how you could say it, and you would not do violence to the Greek text. Let him go to hell. Pretty strong, isn't it? Let's read on. Verse 9. And we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to that which you receive, let, he repeats it, let him be accursed. Let him go to hell. Look at verse 10. For I am now seeking the favor for Am I now seeking the favor of men? No, and neither am I, folks. See, you're not seeking my favor, and I'm not seeking your favor, humanly speaking. We're both seeking, you're seeking, and I'm seeking the favor of God. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? I'm not trying to please any human being. I'm going to preach the word as it is to people as they are with just enough common sense to believe that those who want such a message will be among us to worship with us. And if they don't want it, they don't need to be here. And we don't need to have them here. Can I say it any plainer than that? If I were still trying to please men, listen to this, I would not be. I would not be a servant of Christ. I want to tell you something, folks. I want you to see how simple it is. All these preachers that you have heard, and I've heard many of them, who are people pleasers, I assure you, they're not God called. I want you to read one other passage with me. 2 John, the little epistle, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, then you have Jude and Revelation. 
2 John. I want to read you some very wonderful words of instruction. Let's begin with verse 4. Uh, verse 8, excuse me. <clears throat> this verse has caused me in the past a great deal of trouble. In fact, to the point that we had to exclude a man that resulted in really some turmoil. Verse 8, watch yourselves. And this was the subject I was preaching on that Sunday morning when it happened. That you might not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. All Christians are not going to have the same reward, folks. Not, go, not all of us will have the same reward in heaven. Let's face it. That was my subject that Sunday morning. After the service, this man was ready to fight me. So we ended up excluding him. He was a Baptist, big Baptist. He said, I've never heard that in my life. I said, wait a minute. Look at the verse again. Read it. You haven't read it. And you know why he hadn't read it? He couldn't understand it when he read it. That's why he couldn't. It takes a spiritual mind. That's that sixth sense which God gives by grace. Now look at verse 9. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ. When you have been taught a truth and you don't abide in it, if you are saved, look out. And God takes you home, you're going to lose your reward. I didn't say you lose your salvation, I said reward. The one who abides in the teaching, you see, he has the Father and the Son. Now, if Going back to verse 9 at the beginning. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. Now verse 10. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house, What else? And do not give him a greeting. You know what I tell both Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses when they come to my door and if, I, if they catch me outside or something, they come to me. I quote them a few verses of Scripture and I say, I know what you believe. You deny the deity of Christ. I don't have anything in common with you. And since I don't have anything in common with you, I'm not going to ask you in and we'll discuss it or I'm going to bid you adieu or as it says here give to you a greeting or extend to you a greeting I'm not going to do it and you know why here it is in verse 11 for the one who gives him a greeting participate in his evil deeds. So when you have a conversation with someone who believes in abortion and you're tolerant or anything else that is contrary to a great biblical principle, you must take your stand and depart. See, I don't believe that people should, if they don't like a church, don't stay in it. I wouldn't stay five minutes if I didn't like it. If I heard the preacher say something, I wouldn't say anything to him. I'd be gone. 
And I couldn't, I couldn't get out of the building fast enough. So that's plain enough, isn't it? Well, that isn't all. Let's go a little further. <clears throat> number five. This is question number five, and we want to study this one a little while. And I see now I'll not be able to get to my message, and that'll work out okay. Because both my wife and I will be out of commission some this next week. And so... Uh, She's going to have to have a little work done, a little repair work, so I have to take her to the hospital early Tuesday morning. Number five, what is the difference between the letter, L-E-T-T-E-R, and the intent of the law? Now, you've been hearing things on TV this last week. And that's the reason I'm using this one. Because I can explain a lot in this and there's something practical in this for you and me. What is the difference between the letter of the law and the intent of the law? Let me refresh your minds for a moment before we really start discussing it. <clears throat> when Catherine Harris followed the law to the very letter as the Secretary of State in Florida last week. And she followed it to the letter. What did the Gore bunch do? The lawyers began to speak out on TV and he has one lawyer that's supposed to be the greatest lawyer in the United States. Boyce. I heard him give his arguments. I listened closely. I listened to Tertullus. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? I listened to Tertullus. And I was not impressed with Tertullus. See, justice in this country is as good as you can buy. You say, I don't like what you said. That's your problem, not mine. I said it. I live and die by it. But when she did what she did, according to the letter of the law. They said, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not so. So the spinners started spinning. They found objections. She didn't take into consideration the intent of the law as they referred to it. She did what she did, watch this, arbitrarily. And they started using that word, the adverb arbitrarily. Let's look at the difference between the letter of the law and the intent of the law. I want to ask you this question. How could anyone, how can any lawyer, how could any lawyer judge Catherine Harris's subjective mind? How could they judge it? How could they judge what she was thinking? You can't do that. I can't judge what you're thinking. And I assure you, you can't judge me what I'm thinking. There's a difference between objective and subjective. You didn't hear that discussed. And I want to show you how the Bible... Where do you go? Where do I go? When I want to answer a question, I go to the Bible, and if it's found in the Bible, there's where I'll get my answer. Not from the lawyers. Not from the lawyers. 
not from man-made laws, but from the law of God. Are you listening to me? So let's look at this. I'm going to give you two passages of Scripture here. I want us to read, first of all, turn to Matthew chapter 5. Let's do just a little explaining this morning, if you're interested, and I'm sure you are. I know that the Christians are interested. Let's begin reading with verse 33. Matthew chapter 5. I went right to this to get my answer to the arguments that the lawyers were using. Pro and con. <clears throat> now in the fifth chapter, let me acquaint you with the fifth chapter first of all. The Pharisees were plentiful in that day and time. And the scribes were always forming loopholes for the Jews. Loopholes. And I'm going to explain that to you in a moment. And if you'll notice how all of these throughout the 5th chapter and also into the 6th chapter of Matthew, our Lord, in answering the Pharisees, he would say, it has been said. It has been said. And he would quote how they were saying and how they were quoting Old Testament law. And then he'd say, but I am saying to you. You remember those? You just find it over and over again in chapters 5 and 6. All right, with that before us, now look at verse 33. Again, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, Now, what does he say? That everyone, when you go back up on the matter of divorce, he says to everyone who divorces his wife. And in this instance, in verse 33, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. See, that's what, see, again, you have heard that the ancients were told. And then all in caps in your NASB. Now verse 34. But I say to you, make no oath at all. Now I want that to soak in. Make no thought at all. Make no oath at all. <clears throat> and what's he talking about? Either by heaven for it is the throne of God. For it is the throne of God. Or by the earth, verse 35, for it is the footstool of his feet. Whose feet? God's feet. What else? Or by Jerusalem. Oh, I could get into prophecy on that. <laughs> Jerusalem is the destined city for the rebuilding of the temple and for Christ to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. When he sets up his kingdom. Jerusalem is destined. So you can't take God from any of these, see? And then finally he says, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you make an oath by your head. Now notice what he says in regarding the head. For you cannot make one hair white or black. <laughs> now, are you, get, are you following the language? Those of you who have that sixth sense, you know where we're going. And you already understand what he's talking about. Now, <clears throat> let's read the last verse that we'll read. Verse 37. But let your statement be, yes, yes, or no, 
No. And anything beyond these is from the evil one. What language. I didn't say that, folks. That's what my Lord said. All right? Let's, let's look at this for a little bit. Let's do a little study. First, let's look at letter of the law. And we're going to use this as our example. Letter of the law refers to the actual term or wording of the law. Are you with me? Now let's get that down. And we'll apply all of this and we'll see it in a lot of this passage. And that is seen, that is the letter of the law, is seen as distinct from what? As distinct from the implied or the intent, which is subjective. Now, the objective is the literal word of God. So, intent. So, the first one is objective. The intent of the law refers to the state of the person's mind who has the law. And he's, as he interprets and makes use of the law. That which is intended, the purpose or intention. That is subjective. I said subjective. Well, let's go back for a moment. Now, let me quote a verse of scripture, and I want to ask you if it is how we look at it first of all. Christ said in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. That, folks, is the letter of that law uttered by Christ. He's the only way. No other way. That's the letter of it. That is to be looked at objectively. Objectively. You see, when the Lord did something for me, I didn't know it before, couldn't understand it. But when that verse came to me, either from the pulpit or wherever it came, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. Boy, that's the objective message of God to my heart. To my heart. But that's objective. Now, <clears throat> let's look at it subjectively. Subjectively. I'll give you a verse of Scripture that will help you on that. And that verse of Scripture is Proverbs 14, 12. Let's look at it. <clears throat> if you have time, turn to it. Proverbs, this is Solomon speaking. He says, there is a way that seems right to a man. A way that seems right to him. Now, you talk to a lot of religionists, and the uh, Jehovah's Witness or the person from Salt Lake City, the Mormon, he starts talking and now this this seems right. It seems right. What did Proverbs say? Psalms said there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. So if he keeps thinking in those terms, he's going to end up in hell, isn't he? Regardless of how many times he said, it seems right. That's the intent. That's the subjective side of it. Now, let's explain it a little further. Objective truth may not, it may or may not be understood. 
Think that through for a moment. Objective truth. The truth of John 14, 6 may or may not be understood. The only people who will understand it are those in whose heart God has done a work of grace. Well, let's look at the scripture for that. Turn with me, if you will, please, to Matthew chapter 11. <clears throat> let's let the word speak. I'd like to begin with verse 25. Verse 25. <clears throat> At that time, Jesus answered and said, I praise thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth. Now this is Christ speaking. Don't forget that. And he's speaking to his Father, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou didst hide these things from the wise and intelligent. I, even, I praise you for hiding this from the wise and the intelligent. Who said that? Christ said it. Read that to an Arminian sometime and watch him and listen to him. And this reveal them unto babes. Unto babes. Let's read on. Yes, Father, for thus it was well pleasing in thy sight. It was well pleasing in thy sight to do what he did, withheld information from some and gave it to others. The high and the mighty, he doesn't reveal his truth. To the lowly and those in whose hearts have been a work of grace, they're humble. They've been humbled by God's grace. Let's read on. Verse 27, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. I didn't say that. That's Scripture. All right. Let's think about this. Objective truth may or may not be understood. The spiritual mind alone can understand spiritual truth. And this was Christ's reaction in Matthew chapter 5, 33 through 37. His reaction to being rejected if you look at the verses in their context. Now Paul explains all of this real well in 1 Corinthians 2. Turn to 1 Corinthians 2 and let's begin reading with verse 9 and read through verse 16. <clears throat> but just as it is written, Things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man? Watch this. Here you have subjective and objective. You've got to watch it. For to us God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man? Except a spirit or the spirit of the man, which is in him. He's the only one who really knows what he's thinking, and God knows what he's thinking, of course. But I don't know what he's thinking. Even so, the thoughts of God 
No one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, Paul said, but we have received the Spirit, therefore we are spiritual. I added that, I'm interpreting as I go along. That we might know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak objectively, in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. Why? Because they're spiritual. For their foolishness to him, he cannot understand them because they're spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things yet he himself is appraised by no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord? That he should instruct him. But we have, we have the mind of Christ. So if she follows, talking about Harris, if she follows the letter of the law, She's right in what she's done. And who can judge and say she's acting arbitrarily when you're not, you can't read her mind? I think she is manifested by what she has done and what she did. And that seems to have convinced a lot of noble, honorable people in the state of Florida. Now I want to give you another. This is question number six. Now, this is a touchy one, folks, so get ready for it. But it's worth looking at. Since 90%, 90% of the black people in America, 90% plus, voted for Al Gore. And since 90% voted for Al Gore, I want to ask you a question. What about all the black preachers today whose pulpits were nothing in the world but pulpits to spread politics? Spread new. Vote for Al Gore. Vote for Al Gore. What about the black preachers in the churches? Are they Christian churches? Are all those black preachers true Christian preachers? I'll answer it for you. You don't have to answer it. I don't believe they're all Christian. And I don't believe their institutions are a Christian assembly. You better think that one over again and keep thinking about it. That's serious. What I'm trying to show you, folks, we're divided in this country, right down the middle. And that brings up my seventh question. I'm not going to ask you to commit yourself on the sixth one. I, I, I've, I've already committed myself. I do not believe that the preachers who would vote for Al Gore are Christian men. And I do not believe that their churches are filled with a bunch of Christians. They're religionists, and their institutions are just religious institutions. You say, that's too tough for me. I make it, folks. I won't back down. They haven't given any sense of spiritual discernment. What do you think about Jesse Jackson going down there to stir up? He just went down there to stir things up. That's what he went for. You think he's a Christian? He's a Baptist preacher. Well, why is he spending all of his time in politics if he's a preacher, if he's a man of God? I'm trying to show you where we are today. My seventh question is, how could either Bush or Gore 
lead the nation properly in the face of such polarity of two opposite are contrasting principles, Democrats and Republicans. I'm not a Republican, and I'm not a Democrat. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. How could either Bush or Gore, if Gore wins it, Who can look up to him with any respect? And let me see if you know this. I have, a, I have a document on this. Did you know it's already in the mill that in four years from now Hillary would be running for president with the hope of getting both she and her husband back in the White House? in four years. And they'll do anything under the sun to get it. Now, I don't know what the Lord is going to permit. I don't. But I want to tell you how I feel about it, and I want to give you the Christian perspective of it. I believe God's in control. If Gore gets in, I'm not going to complain. Because God in his permissive will has permitted it. Now you may ask this question. Well, how in the world could you say some of the things you said this morning and then be satisfied? How could you? That sounds like double talk. Uh-uh. No. God's in control. I do not know. He may be getting ready to punish us more than we deserve or we think I should say we deserve that's the attitude of a lot of folk but we'll get exactly what we deserve whatever happens if Gore is the president we're going to get what we deserve because here is something to think about since God is in control things are going to have to get worse watch this before it gets better. You and I know that there are going to be wars and rumors of wars. There is the battle of Armageddon to be fought. And we've never, why slaughter, we've never, we've never dreamed of some of the things that are going to take place. All you have to do is read the book of Revelation, folks, and that's going to be, that's going to literally take place. So God may be preparing us for it. So if Gore goes into office in the next few days or weeks, I say, thank you, Lord. Won't be long now. Looks like that things are shaping up for the manifestation of the Antichrist, and all of these are Antichrist preparing for the Antichrist. If Bush goes in, I don't think he could do anything. He would have such opposition in Congress, in the Senate, in the House of Representatives. He would have such opposition and a 50 way t How could he do anything? So, folks, the future for America is not very bright. I said it's not very bright. And all of this that is happening right now, this mess it is taking place under the permissive will of God for a purpose so I can thank him. Not my will, but your will be done.